in here with us. Okay. And um, starting the opening prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you, Lord, because this is the day that you have made. And we thank you, Lord, because we, we rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, Lord, for keeping us from the start of the week to the end, even up until now. I thank you, Lord, because it's been by your glory, by your grace, that there are many people smarter, stronger, richer, and wiser than us who have lived that same way we live, and yet they are not here today. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We do not take it for granted. And we give our glory back unto you. But even as we've gathered today to learn at your feet, to learn your word, to learn about what it means to be a new creature, to know what it means to be born again, to be made anew, we pray that you will be here with us, that you will touch the tongue that will speak, you touch the, the words that mean will be brought down, that when we bring them up, I pray that it to be true revelations through you that we'll be that we receive and not revelations through our own will, not through the thoughts of man will be what you want us to receive and to be your will and your will alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. Amen. And now to start with, you are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, but to give up, I'll be a fool. You are my all in all. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, raising you up again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill me up. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, what is your name? Jesus, Lamb of God, what is your name? You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. But to give up, I'll be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus. Lamb of God, what is your name? Jesus, Lamb of God, what is your name? I as the deer panted for the water, so my soul longed after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to work. Thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone will my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire. 
desire and I long to worship Thee. You are love on my heart's desires and I long to worship Thee. Father God, we thank you once again because we know you are here and we know that you are with us and we pray that even as we congregate together to learn about your feet, that you be with us and that you teach us your words in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you all for coming and thank you all for being here. And uh, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you all for uh, not being too tired to make it here even with all the changes. And uh, I pray that even as you come and you listen, that you'll be blessed here in Jesus' name. And uh, today, so we're talking about what may, does being a new creature mean. And to do that, we're going to be touch, putting the Bible verse down for first and foremost. And the one that came to my mind when I got this topic in my heart was 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, which was pretty much something that kept rattling in me because, you know, it's one of the Bible passages they put in you when you first, you know, in the little classes. And yeah, therefore, if any man be in Christ is a new creature, all things have passed away and all things have become new. And that's kind of what I want to touch upon today. What does it mean to be a new creature? And just to expand on that, because I once saw someone say that reading the Bible verses at once isn't really good. We need to know what comes before and what comes after. Just want to put 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 18, just so we can get somewhat of more context. Uh, wherefore, henceforth, no, we are no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now we know him no more. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God, who had reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And that's something that I believe added a lot of context that's usually I didn't really think about until I looked at that. But before going any further, I just want to like give just basic definitions. First, what does it mean to be new? New means fresh, not existing in the same way, never existed in this form before. And creation is a creation of God. That would mean that when the Bible says that you are a new creature, creature, it's saying that you are continually and honestly made anew. That when you give your life to Christ, you are the new you. Yes, you still look the same, but you are not the same. The names you had before, the titles you had before are no longer attached to you, nor can you be judged by them. If you were a thief before and you give your life to Christ in the eyes of God, you are no longer a thief. You are now being reborn as a child of God. It's why some armed robbers in like we know of people who can commit crimes can give their life to Christ. And yet God will still accept them. God will still take them in as his sons and his daughters, even though they have committed crimes. That's because in the eyes of God, when they gave their life to Christ, they became new and they became renewed and again. And the thing is, being born again is kind of like a central pillar of Christianity. It's kind of like pretty much the whole crux in which our entire thing is built upon. We are born again through Jesus Christ. But it's something that not everyone really thinks about or anyone really understands. Like, for example... I just want to ask a question. When you gave your life to Christ, how did it feel? Have you ever thought about that feeling before? And now that you've spent a while in your Christian journey, do you think that feeling 
is still what you're working on? And someone just answered that question. When you give your life to Christ, how did it feel? And how compared to how you feel in your Christian work with God now? Any volunteers or should I start calling out names? Okay. Itunu, um, can you answer the question? When you give your life to Christ, how did it feel? And how does it compare to now in your Christian life? Um, good evening, everybody. Mm-hmm. When yeah. I gave my life to Christ, I felt um, joy. I was extremely happy, you know, the um, assurance of being saved and um, transformed into a new creature. And now I'm just, I'm still happy. I still have the joy of the Lord. And I don't worry about... Like not every time I don't worry about um like my future or or situations. I just go to God in prayer and it's settled. So it's still joyful. Thank thank you. I think. Thank you. Thank you. Uh anyone else? Um by Henry, Sister Zainab, any how did it feel when you gave your life to Christ and how do you feel now? Uh, I'll just use me as an example. When I gave my life to Christ, it was like someone reached into me and like touched me and assured me that things will be okay, that it was okay. And now as I walked through the journey, it's kind of like whenever things get rough and things get short, I just go back and call to God so that he can comfort me and give me the feeling that um I always have just to help calm and understand. okay yeah I understand where Henry, uh, you're in transit right now yeah so yeah and uh, like Sister Itunu said that when you give your life to Christ you're transformed you're renewed and the thing is that it's it's not a, like a it's not a figurative thing it's not a symbolic change like it's actually quite literal because if you open the bible to romans 6 verse 4 it says that therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the father even so we should walk in newness of life it's kind of like a literal thing but I'm guessing that when you hear things like that, you're probably going to be like the uh, man that was with Jesus that said, when I'm born again, must I go into my mother and be born out of the womb and new? It's it's not really that literal, but it is literal. For instance, God is a spirit. And we have been described as spiritual beings having a physical experience. So when we are born anew born again is not our physical flesh that is born anew but our spiritual flesh because when adam it through adam the first adam sin was brought into the world and everyone descended from him which is everyone has sin within them and then through jesus the second adam we are the ability to be born anew to be born again in christ to be remade and restructured in the image in the in a new image that is without sin that is without the taint of like sin that is within us and it's kind of like needed because the, the bible says that god cannot behold iniquity cannot behold sin that it's an abomination towards god but that me has led to it have many misconceptions coming up about what it means to give your life to Christ. Like, for instance, there's the grace principle that I've heard of. 
that says that God is an ever forgiving God, and He is that even if you even if you continually sin and sin and sin and sin, that that's how it works. You sin and you can give your life to Christ and God will forgive you and you can just continue sinning again. And it's kind of like, yes, there is grace and the grace had bound. But what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to stop. You're supposed to sin, give your life to Christ and then leave the part from the sin, not go back to the sin again and again. And that's a misconception that happens. Like the world has misconceptions construed what it means to be born again it's become fashionable for so at some point it was fashionable that you call yourself a christian you say you attend that you believe in god but you you don't exhibit the fruits of the spirit and the bible says by their fruits you shall know them so that's kind of like a misconception that they said that you can just say that you're born again without actually showcasing the fruits of the spirit and uh, is there any other misconceptions that anyone has heard when it comes to being a new creature, uh, giving your life to Christ? I see you unmuted, Maya. Do you want to say something? Okay. Okay, you're muted again. Um, is there like any misconceptions that anyone's heard when it comes to being born again and being reborn being a new creature what misconceptions have you heard about it that you think tends to harm more people in their christian journey than actually helps okay failing oh. yeah yeah so, yeah Shava. Oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to give an example. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, one misconception that I think is prosperity teaching. I feel like sometimes when people preach the gospel to someone or they get someone to give their life to Christ, they focus more on prosperity than about a life with Christ. And like Itunu said, the joy, and like you said as well, the joy and the grace and the peace of mind that comes with it because then you know, like, even though I don't know what is currently going on now, I know that at the end of the day, God is going to help me. God is going to sort it out and all. But I feel um, when people preach the gospel sometimes, they just go ahead and tell them, oh, in Christ, every day is a smooth journey. Like, you, your life will be perfect, literally, and all. But then, I don't know. I feel there's just a way that, I don't know if what I'm saying, if you get what I'm saying, but yeah, then yeah, yeah, I get what I you're saying. That's a major misconception because then something happens in their lives and then they come back and they are like, Oh, I thought you said when I give my life to Christ, this and this would happen to me. So I think that's uh I think that can be um a misconception that people um get when they give their life to Christ. Yeah, uh, thank you, Shawa. Thank you. And that's actually uh massive misconception because even jesus didn't even say it was going to be a good journey he said that the world will hate us for we deny it so yeah being hated means that sometimes things will not go your way but god will always make the way straight for you in the end like it's said that the heart the mind that god, taught god as for us are for good and not for evil toward an expected end and that's that's a good thing. That's a good thing because the things that God has in store for us are good. Yeah. And um, yeah, and the thing is that that can also issue that prosperity teaching can also affect people because now they don't think they need to change. They think that things will begin to work different from them when we're supposed to change. Because even though we become a new creature, even though we are made anew, we are still everything around us is to what the old worldly man liked, what the old worldly man was like. So that means we're going to be very heavily tempted. So that means we need to like look inside ourselves and outside ourselves. All the things within us, the things of the, of the world that don't edify, hate, scorn, lust, envy, all those things, we need to look within ourselves and work upon that. Like if you were someone who always got angry very easily, being born again will help you, like the spirit of the Lord will come into you and touch you and help calm you down. But that anger will still be in you. So now you have to work on yourself even more to help 
get rid of the anger, find the source of the anger, bring go to, bring it to God in Christ and, and work through it so that you're not going to be the same angry person. If you find yourself, um, if you find yourself being easily jealous of your fellow man, you should you need to work on that. You need to work on um on the jealousy that's within you. You need to work on moving beyond that. And people who think that they'll be prosperous when they give your life to Christ don't tend to work on that because they believe that everything should work well for them. And that's something else about when you give your life to Christ is that the things around you can still tempt you to like draw back. For instance, if you were in the world and you made good friends in the world, that will make it so that most of your friends, people that you're surrounded by would be unbelievers. And it's kind of like when you're in your Christian journey and you're surrounded by unbelievers, it's going to make it harder for you to progress in your Christian journey. Because if your friends you're with are people you did uh, recreational drinking and drugs with, you're not going to be able to do that anymore because that's against the will of God for, uh, for his children. So you wouldn't be doing that anymore. And if that was how you bonded with those friends, you might end up having to distance yourself from them. But And if you don't distance yourself from them, you might end up falling back into your old ways and into your old sin. So it's kind of like you need to work on yourself internally to look at all the roots, all the things that came from you that you need to work and you need to move out. And you also need to work on yourself externally and look at the people around you that if if you're not edifying you, if you're not believers the same way you are, maybe you should go to them, try to bring them to Christ and then you guys work together because it says man chaplain is man and two can work together. So you should try to preach the gospel to them and try to work with them and try to help them to move forward. But this kind of leads me to something else, baptism. And before I even touch on baptism, I just want to ask you a question. Is baptism important? And if, and if you have been baptized, why did you decide to get baptized? Um, anyone? Okay. Yeah, good evening, Black Family. Good evening. Really, yeah, I am just joining in. I'm sorry, I'm just getting in. I only heard about your question now, and I just felt yeah. I should just quickly answer. I don't know what you've been discussing earlier, but concerning baptism, I think it's an important because it's one of the things that Christ did, yeah, that he could have decided not to have done it, but he did it all the same. And uh, I decided to do it because I felt it's like a sign of a death and resurrection. Like when you go into the water, you're dying and you're coming alive to a new life. So that's what it means to me. And that's why I did it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ma. And just to get you caught up, um, we are talking about new being a new creature and what it means to be born again in Christ. And we're talking about how, even though it is a solid foundation of our faith, of our belief, that a lot of people don't really focus on what it means to be born again and to be a new creature, that they don't know that it's not just a symbolic thing. It's a literal transformation that happens within us. And it is a transformation that can be reversed if we do not, if we're not careful, if we do not watch ourselves internally and externally. And yeah, and I agree with you about the baptism that it is important. It is, as you said, a sign of the death and rebirth of God. And I think that when we do that, it's kind of like a showcasing to the world, like a firm, like we're giving our allegiance to what it is. We're pretty much telling the world that this is that we are Christian, that this is who we believe in, that this is who we trust and who we put our faith in. And I think the baptism is a very important way of externalizing the internal change and internal growth that we have gone through. And uh, let's see, from Ayo, we have this message. Water and Holy Spirit baptism are both important and scriptural with significance being birth and resurrection. However, we are not saved by baptism, but by grace. Yes, uh, thank you. 
And I, I, I agree with that, as I was saying, is that it is a sign, a showcase of the internal transformation externally, a way to like show our, our allegiance, saying that this, I have been touched by God, I have been transformed by God, I've been saved by him. And true to that, I want to do this. I want to showcase this significance. I want to go through this process to show that I am in fact renewed. And that mean I mean another question that like came up when I was researching this journey is that do you need the new birth? Because the God says that He loves everyone and that if you if you give your life to Christ, you are a new creature. So does they need to be like a literal transformation within you for that to for you to be like a new creature? Like, can't you just is does it have to be literal? Can it be symbolic? Because some people say that they've given their life to Christ for like several years and they felt nothing change in them. Does that mean that they're gonna go to hell? Does that mean they haven't been saved? That kind of stuff. So I just want to bring that up. Is that do you need the new birth like is the new birth something that needs to be done otherwise you're gonna go straight to hell or is this kind of like uh you give your life to christ and say jesus i accept you and then everything will be done and then all the other thing is just optional or do you believe that the new birth is like a crucial thing that needs to happen that needs to be done um let's go with mayawa Uh, like you both talking, Mayowa? Can you repeat your question, please? Yeah, I was saying that the new birth is something we're talking about now, being a new creature. Do you think it needs to be a literal new birth? Can it just be symbolical? You say the words and let God accept you? Or do you, does the change need to happen? Or can you just say the words and then have God accept you like that? I think it's both symbolic and like not physically being born again, but physical. I feel like when you say the words, you should act on it. So just saying the words doesn't make an impact. So you have to say the words and you have to act towards it. So you have to abstain from your past sins. You have to abstain from your past wrongdoings. So you have to work in it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I understand. Um, anyone have anything else to add to that? Itunu, Shewa, uh, Zainab? Is new birth needed? Or can you just say the words and God will accept you in heaven when the end time comes? Praise God. Hallelujah. I think it's both, as Mara said, because the Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you are saved. And it's also um, a, an action. Like when you give your life to Christ, you should also have like the, the effects of of change like you've you're in like you said earlier you're a new creation so it should be evident in your evident in your character in your way of life yeah thank you yeah yeah uh anyone else have anything to add okay uh like a response i'm going to add uh two bible passages galatians 2 20 and romans 8 22 to 23 uh galatians 2 verse 20 says um i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And Romans 8, 22 to 23 says, 
for we know that the whole creation groaneth and tra traveleth in pain together unto now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption of our body. And I think those words by Paul pretty much showcase that it's kind of like not just symbolical, but it's also literal. It creates a change. Uh, let's see, there's a chat here. Yeah, it creates a change that uh, will work, that tra transforms in us. Like Paul gave a visceral imagery that he died in Christ and came out and now Christ lives in him. And that is his true, that life that Christ put in him, that he's now m moving through his life. So it's kind of like a, that evokes a literal imagery that the old things that even if we're tempted to go back to our old ways we have to actively physically move and uh, let's see uh, now our response says that romans 12 verse 22 renewal of the mind philippians 4 8 thought and actions will be evidence to men that you are saved Christian was coined from actions of the people in Antioch. And that is another, that is very true, that the word Christian comes from Christ-like because they acted as Christ did and that we are to renew our mind and our actions be given to men. Yeah, and that's kind of it. I think that's kind of where we kind of tend to drop the ball in our actions because we say that we are Christians. We say that we are children of god that we act in that we are in the image of god but we don't act in the image of god would not manifest the fruit of the spirit the love joy peace kindness long suffering faithfulness joy all of those things is the fruit of the spirit not the fruits meaning we're to exhibit all of them well i don't think most people that claim to be christian exhibit any of them and I think that's kind of where the issue, the delusion that of the Christian faith stands from is we need the new birth because, well, our flesh has been tainted by sin, as we stated earlier. And that taint has not just physically cut us off from God because God cannot behold sin, but it's also emotionally and instinctually cut us from god because uh, god hates sin and we now instinctively like sin due to our nature and the bible says that if you love god you will love what he loves and hates what he hates but and that if you instinctively like what god hates that means instinctively our instincts actively drive us away from god because the nature of man is unfortunately sin due to the actions of Adam. And I think that's kind of the big thing is that even if you are a moral person, even if you are someone who strives to do good in everything you do, even if you strive to do good in every action you take and everything you do, sooner or later, your flesh will catch up to you and your flesh will convince you to do something that is bad but if you walk in the truth of god walk in the pathway he lays before you and only walk in where god tells you to walk step where god tells you to step the chances of your you straying and going to sin following the ways of god going to destruction following god is astronomically low or pretty much zero even because god won't lead you to damnation the Bible says that he will not allow temptation greater than ourselves to reach us. That would mean everything we're tempted by is something God knows we can overcome. And in that knowledge that everything before us we can overcome, we should be seeking to find the ways to overcome it. And succumbing to it is an act of weakness, I suppose. This is a way of looking at that. And um, that's seems everything i got does anyone have any questions to ask regarding 
this topic or anything to put down regarding the topic of new creature being born again and rebirth. Anyone have anything to add to it? Or any questions to ask about it? I think I have a point. Okay. To add. Yeah. Add away. In, in James 3 verse 16, it has to do with your, the question you asked. In James 3 verse 16, they talk about faith without works is dead. So I feel like that is an answer to your question about whether being born again is just a just saying I'm born again or an actual act. Because I, I feel like from that verse, it's telling us that if you just say you're born again or you have no works to back it up, you're not really born again. Okay. That's what I get from that verse. Because we're saved only by faith. And the faith that we're saved by produces good works. So if you don't have the good works, are you really saved? Are you really born again? Okay, that is a good point, and that is an excellent point. And um, a question was put on the group chat that says, is one saved forever saved? And I personally think that that mentality is one of the most dangerous mentalities to have when it comes to your Christian journey, that believing that once you've been saved, that you're forever saved. Because um, the I don't know where in the Bible it comes from, but it says that if a sinner gives his life to Christ and dies, he does not die as a sinner, he dies as a righteous man. But it says if a righteous man does years of righteousness, but then sins and then dies, he dies a sinner. And I think that should answer your question that once you being once saved, not forever saved, you need to keep yourself saved by abstaining from fleeing from all appearances of sin all appearances of evil so i think that's something we should all keep in mind um any other point or questions to ask or even any contributions or answers that differ from the answer i gave or to the points that were raised up just now How does a person, a newly born, who is newly born again, navigate a genuine and honest journey to, of a uh, journey, journey of righteousness? Okay, the journey of righteousness, and this is kind of gonna sound like a generic answer that you might receive, but I think this is. But before I answer that question, I'm gonna put it out to the group first. How does a new born again navigate a genuine and honest journey of righteousness? Uh, can you just please leave an, uh, receive an answer? Say to uh, Sister Shawa, Sister Tosi, if you could please. Um, I feel like when you give your life to Christ, the first thing that happens so you obviously, because even when Jesus was living, he said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, the one that is going to guide you on everything. And if you read the Bible, especially the part that talks about repentance, if you read it in like Amplified or Easy Version, he always says that, that when Jesus says repent, it says in a bracket, it's a continuous renewal of your mind where God, like Jesus walks with you. He goes through um your actions who you were before and everything and he's constantly changing it he's constantly looking at you he's constantly working with you so when you give your life to christ i believe the only way that you can live righteously is by asking god for help because there's no other way to do it because there's like tim Lens mentioned earlier he said something about how when you um give your life to Christ, but then you still have friends that are in the world. Those kind of situations happen, those kind of things arise whereby your flesh becomes weak and you don't know, and you miss the things of, or you miss the pleasures of the past. And then you are looking back at the way you used to behave, maybe because of the thrill or like the excitement. So that is where Jesus comes in. That is how Jesus helps us. He, he transforms us daily. So I, I believe when you give your life to Christ, the only person that can genuinely help you 
is Jesus. Like you ask him for help and he can send you someone in a form of like a friend or some, um, yeah, or a mentor. But I feel like the first person you should go to is Jesus. Okay, thank you, Shawa. Uh, Sister Tosin, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, thank you, Brad, for million. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, to answer the question about how to go Not, through yeah. a, a honest and genuine journey. Sorry? Oh, uh, yeah, I was going to read the question out again. If you didn't know it, was what I was going to do. Okay. Okay. Okay, like... What I, I actually noted here is almost like what Sister Shell already said. But I'll start with, for everybody that is newly born again, the first thing should be to read your Bible. That everything you need is in the Bible. So read your Bible, whichever way you, you go about it. Maybe you have a Bible reading plan or decide to choose a book of the Bible. But the bottom line is, line is just read your bible pray every day like the song says and another thing is to go to church why go to church yeah you go to church so you can be in the gathering of fellow believers you pray every day because that's the one way you you get get clarity or you get to know the voice of god yeah yeah when god needs to speak to you when because god is always speaking and lastly i'll say associate with like-minded people I didn't say associate with church people and I didn't say associate with um, uh, fellow workers, but associate with like-minded people, people that are also on the journey of growing as Christians, people that have the same desire and the same thirst like you. Definitely, we know that not everybody in church has that kind of mind. So you find your own kind of group and work with those people. So I think that's all I have to say. And I pray God will help us as we go, because all of us were all also, we are all in at a particular growth level. Not no no one can say I've fully attained. So whether you're new or you've been there, all I've said still applies. It's a journey. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. And like they've said, <coughs> sorry, like they've said, uh, let's see if I go ahead. For a new convert, spend enough time to study the word. Pray and be surrounded by mature Christian and have someone to mentor you and to be accountable to on your struggles. And yeah, that pretty much covers all the points I was actually going to say then. That uh, we're going to say something to know. So, no, okay. Yeah. Like all the points I was going to say have been covered so far, but I'll just reiterate them again that read your Bible and study your Bible every day, pray and try to know the will and the word of God every day, have a Bible reading plan, have a mentor that you're accountable to, someone that's been in the journey, that's oh, that's been in the journey for longer than you, that's someone you can talk to, go to for guidance and journey and surround yourself with like-minded individuals because as Satoshi said, unfortunately, not everyone that's in the church is a genuine uh, born again some people are just church goers and some people are currently backsliding so you just have to find yourself with people who are earnest believers who are constantly striving to know the face and the will of god in their life and regardless of where you converted from whether it be muslim whether it be buddhism i'm certain that if you do that that god will always show forth for you and you always guide the way through you and uh, yeah, even another thing is that when it seems like God is not there, when it seems like God is quiet, that when it seems like God is doing is not there, don't panic because it's not like God is not there. It's like God is silent. He might be silently doing something or he might be silently waiting for something and just telling you to just wait with him. You need to just meditate on the word, ask for guidance and know how to react in the silence and when that happens i know that god will reveal the answer to you in the moment and everything will go well um any other questions or any other comments to put on the floor before we go to our concluding prayers
Okay, for the lack of none, we'll just go into the prayers now. Let's talk in the attitude of prayer as we begin to close. But Lord God, I thank you, Lord, for this session. I thank you, Lord, because it is true your you, your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding that you were to bring this session, that you were to unwrap this session, and you were to guide us in this session. I pray that even as we have talked about this, that this will not be the end of the talk, that all those who truly want, who are truly working this journey, who truly want to know you are more, those who want to, who are born again, that want not to continue to move in this journey, those who seek to be born again, and those who are back, backslid and want to come back onto you, I pray that you touch every single one of them, that you be with every single one of them, that you have every single one of them to come closer to you, to understand you the more and to not be and to not be pushed down and to be lost in the Christian journey. I pray that you be with every single one of those individuals, those who are be, going to be born again, those who are going to be born again, those who just started their journey, and those who are long since on their journey. I pray that you be with every single one of them, guide them all, bless them all, and perfect everything to do with their lives, and everything to work with them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, before we all close um there's some announcements to put down um next week sunday is the easter sunday and due to the session we're going to be having a combined service with our mother church mount zion parish um yeah and let's see what else uh, there is the national power encounter that's happening in ramberg if anyone wants to be a part of that, uh, it's a con subcontinent two pro uh, program. So if anyone wants to be a part of that special program, just reach out to me, Stetunu, Statosni, or any of the ESCOs, and we will try to see how we can get as many people from House of Joy and everyone to go to the National Power Encounter. And uh, is there... Any other announcements I may have left out? Certainly, for those any other announcements that need to be put down? I think that's all for today. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ma. And with that said, uh, shall we say the grace in fellowship? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us yes. now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Surely. Goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Uh, we shall not die, but live to declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming, and I hope you have an amazing rest of your week.